So hi, notaries. Um, welcome. This is really such an exciting day. Um, thanks for spending your time with us and talking about common mistakes and how to avoid them and how to fix them. Um, in my life, I always think that being a notary is a true privilege. Uh, but for me, it is an even greater privilege to be hosting a panel with people like Laura and Bill and Jamie and Ty. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce these amazing people in alphabetical order. Laura Buer from Modesta, California, is known as the Notary's Notary, a 17-year seasoned California notary with training in national notary laws. Laura has developed a practical approach to building a competent, compliant, and productive notary practice. She coaches notaries one-on-one -on -one to build their own state's notary knowledge, develop an efficient loan signing process to speed up the signing without rushing the signers. If you, on a personal note, if you have never seen Laura give a presentation live or for right now, uh, virtual on Zoom, um, trust me, you are missing something really outstanding. So go on YouTube, find her, listen to her, and you will learn an awful lot. Um, Ty Brown is a colleague and a friend from New Jersey who serves as a notary consultant, a mentor, and a motivational speaker. You can catch Ty's interesting and informative shows on YouTube. On a personal note, on February 28th, I'm going to chat with Ty on her show. We're going to discuss networking and apostilles and how to make it all work for you. Make sure you catch us on the 28th on YouTube under the Abnormal Notary. Although, on another personal note, I happen to think Ty is very normal. I am pleased to introduce one of the nicest people I know, Jamie Liggins. Jamie is a colleague and a friend who hails from Shreveport, Louisiana. In addition to being a successful notary entrepreneur, Jamie is a certified notary signing agent, field inspector, mentor, and instructor. She was selected as the Notary of the Year in 2004. She was a keynote speaker in 2018 and has presented with the NNA for the past 17 years. Jamie's book, 10 Ways to Say Notarize This When Life Happens, is due to be published by summer of 2021. And on a personal note, sometime later this year, Jamie and I are publishing a book entitled What You Need in Your Notary Toolbox. And it is my great honor to introduce Bill Soroka from Phoenix, Arizona. Bill is the founder of notarycoach.com and author of the Amazon best-selling book, Sign and Thrive, How to Make Six Figures as a Mobile Notary and Loan Signing Agent, which is a must read. Bill is also a full-time mobile notary and loan signing agent who has created multiple six-figure enterprise using his special techniques that he absolutely loves to share with everyone. He also hosts the Tuesday Titans, which many of us attend. On a personal note, Sir Soroka, I want to say thank you for embracing my idea for this forum. And then there's me, your queen of apostilles, <laughs> hailing from the city of brotherly love, not to mention the city of the Philadelphia cheesesteak. I have, an, I own and operate a general notary business and an apostille business. Um, my notary business is 24 hours a day, seven days a week of general notary work. Um, and uh, that is where I got some of these ideas for this forum. I have also co-authored a book with my friend and colleague, Daniel C. Lewis, entitled Make Your Business Our Business. I'm an NNA ambassador and a past presenter. And in my spare time, I love teaching notaries at the Lawrence Institute for Notaries and sharing some of what being a notary has taught me. So one thing, I'd like to give a warm welcome to the enrolled agents who, um, enrolled agents are to uh, accountants what uh, PAs are to doctors. And enrolled agents are also, many of them are notaries. So we wanna try to welcome them to the notary family and have them uh, be a part of what we do. Uh, so now I'm gonna take one more minute and tell you how 
this, this event is going to work. Uh, we'll review a few slides and then we'll take some questions and we'll keep doing that. And when we have finished the slides, we'll go into complete Q&A. If your questions do not get answered, do not worry because we will save the chat. We will go through it and we will try to answer every question that you have. Now that brings us to my last interesting point. I have provided you with a, an email. Now you're gonna get a, a flip book at the end that you can download, which is um, this presentation. And at the back, you'll see an email that says moreforums at gmail.com. So if there are things that you would have liked us to cover, or things you can suggest you'd like us to cover in the future, just click on that link, tell us what you want, tell us what you would like, and we'll do our very best to have another one of these and to bring you exactly what you would like to hear. I did get a few emails this morning. A lot of people seem to want to know a lot about acknowledgements. So maybe that's something that we will touch on in this course, but maybe we'll put more of an emphasis on it in the next course. So. If everybody's ready, I say let's bounce. <laughs> let's do it. Hey, um, so the first topic that we're going to, I've broken it down into general notarization and signing agents. So first we're gonna talk about things that pertain to general notarization. And one, the first slide that I came up with we came up with was notaries failing to require personal appearance. Um, so let's stick with alphabetical order. Laura, want to talk about it? Well, you know, uh, sometimes I just can't believe that can still happen. Uh, <laughs> that a document could be notarized uh, without ever having the principal signer in front of that notary. Um, when we look at the wording that we filled out, uh, it, it's all about personal appearance. And of course that has to happen one of two ways, physically in front of me, if you're in a state where there's Ron, then the technology is facilitating that. But let's just talk about, you know, face-to-face -face old school. Um, this is not something I can do from the phone, from the fax, from the email. I need to see my person mm -hmm. because not only are they going to provide me identification, I need to evaluate that. And I need to have that person in front of me to compare to what's being provided to me. Uh, and the single most important thing that we do as notaries is identify them. And how can we do that if we can't see them? And to know that they willingly signed the document, right? These are the two big things that we do. And if we're missing the signer, you can't accomplish either one. Uh, I, I'm going to add something and tell you that in my office, I get many people who come in and say to me, but you know my mother because she was here three weeks ago and you signed a paper for her and you know me because I come here all the time. And then when I say I can't do that because your mother's not here, they get very upset with me. And my little answer, my little stock answer is, I know that you mean well, and I know that your mama means well, but if I make a mistake, then you and I are going to be on the courthouse steps and we don't want to go to the courthouse steps. Sometimes they really like that and they leave and they do come back. And sometimes they're not too happy with me, but you know, you have to, you have to. Um, so Jamie, I see your hand is up. Yes. I was going to um, add that. Okay. So say the person does appear, how are you going to prove that? your notary journal. I'm, I'm gonna say in my state in Louisiana, notary journal is not required. So okay. I, I had an incident where I went on about my business, I performed a notarization and I had my, my backup proof because a notary journal is the mother standard of care to have. I don't care if your state says you don't, it's, it's not required. It's just good common sense and good um, business ethics to have a notary journal as your proof. So I get a phone call from um, an attorney saying this person said that they didn't know that you, that uh, they didn't get something notarized. 
And I said, okay. So I went and pulled my notary journal out. And I said, do you have any identification for this person? Well, he, the ID copy that he sent me, the signature on that ID card was the exact same signature that I had in my notary journal. I said, it matches. Mm -hmm. And I had information for the person that claimed they didn't appear. So it could go the opposite way. It could be a flip reverse. So they were, I said, is there anything else you need? Do I need to call my attorney? They, oh, no, no, no. We're fine. We're fine. Then um, a month or so later, I get a call from a police department out in Southern California. Same person, same claim. Once again, I had my proof. So even though a, a person may say that they don't want to appear, a person might appear and claim that they didn't appear. So it's good to have your backup proof always in your notary journal. I'm uh, so glad you brought that up, Jamie, because that's exactly what I was going to say. It, it kind of boggles my mind that there are states that don't require a notarial journal uh, for this. So it is really just common sense, as you said, which is not always common practice, but as notaries, we really should be having a journal. And if you have decided to be a loan signing agent, that's actually part of, if you're certified through the NNA, you've made the agreement to use a journal. That's part of the code of conduct. So uh, well, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, I, I think this is a good place for me to recount this one little story. And that is that the last time that we were at the NNA convention um, at five o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and it was the district attorney's office in Philadelphia. And they were looking for a scammer who had uh, signed apparently five or six deeds and they were all my signature. And I was able to give them from, I believe we were in Las Vegas. And I was able to give them not only their names, but all their information and the streets and the, and the deed information. And the guy said, wow. And he said, you enjoy where I told him where I was. And he said, when, when you come back, we'll have to take your statement, which he did. Um, and they, they, they would have had a problem had I just said, well, I don't keep records. I don't, I don't, I don't think that that's a good, I agree with all of you. I mean, how hard is it to keep a journal? And now with the electronic journals, it's not that hard at all. Anybody, Ty? Yeah, I mean, everybody honestly said pretty much everything. I mean, I have to agree with, with everybody. I think that if your state doesn't require you to have a journal, have a journal anyway because you never know what could come back around. And if you don't have the ability to say, hey, yes, I did sign Ty Brown on this date at this time, mm -hmm. it's really a mute point in my opinion. So I think journaling is, is paramount to everything. Okay. Um, so I think with that, we'll move on to the next slide. And the next slide is notaries taking a picture of the signer's ID with your phone. And I know we already made Laura first, but we're <laughs> gonna make her first again, because I know for a fact that this is Laura's pet peeve. And you and Laura would not take a picture with her phone. Am I correct, Laura? 100%. I, I never take somebody, a picture of somebody's ID in my own cell phone. Right. Uh, I always arrange for them to make their own copies. If they wanna take their own picture in their own phone, and send it to be printed. I don't have an issue with that, but I'm not putting it in my own phone. We don't know the security of our phones. Uh, right. And uh, transferring that kind of information around, I just don't think is a good idea. Mm -hmm. And I do get signing services who specifically direct me, do not take a picture with your own phone. Right, mm -hmm. and, and, and you could, yeah. uh, Jamie, your hands up. Oh, yeah, I, I wanna go after Jamie after that, Drew. Okay. okay. I was just going to say that the, the key thing is being an educated notary and a notary signing agent because you might get companies that you work for that tell you to do this. Yeah. And so if you're new at this, then you may say, okay, I'll go ahead and do it. But that's so you have to be educated. And it's good you're here. You all are here because uh, I've been told to do this and I don't do it either because it's just uh, uh, we're supposed to be centered at preventing fraud and if we're doing something like this then here we are could easily be involved in something that someone accuses us of doing 
later down the line, it may be now, maybe later, and here we have information on, on um, our phone because they can say, you did take a picture. So I just don't. And I always... Uh, back I think this information is, is, is particularly useful for new notaries because I know when I was a new notary, I took the picture on my phone a bunch of times until a more experienced notary um, talked to me and said, no, 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 that isn't what you should be doing and explained the reason why. Um, you know, you yeah. could lose your phone tonight. Someone could steal it. And if they, if you lose it or someone steals it and you have all these pictures of everybody's driver's licenses, um, that's, that's an open invitation for fraud. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Jude, I have to agree. Um, one thing, this is one thing if I can, and Jamie, I don't know if I'm over talking you. I don't know if you were finished or not. No, I wasn't, um, but it's okay. Go ahead. No, no, go for it. No, no. Finish. I do that to Jamie all the time. She knows me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. No, Jamie, go ahead. Finish. I'll go after you. <laughs> I think I was going to say um, it's, it's not necessarily notary law. It's uh, a, a tip to prevent fraud right. and fraudulent accusations. I think that's what I was going to say, but if you go high, it might sparkle something, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, no worries. Yeah, so I, I wanted to talk on the whole ID and capturing with your phone. Um, a lot of the title companies, lenders, signing services, in the instructions will say, hey, just like Laura stated, do not take a picture of your ID on your phone. So this is what I do when I call to do my appointments. I say, hey, Mr. Seller, I'm sorry, Mr. Seller, hey, Ty, uh, I'm looking to, to talk to you and discuss about your loan appointment. You confirm all the details. The next thing that I ask is say, hey, unfortunately, legally, I do not want to take your picture over the phone. Can you make a copy of your ID? So when I come to the table, their picture of their ID is already there. You don't have to take a picture on your phone. You don't have to do anything. Now, this is one thing I will tell you. You can based upon someone answering the phone, you can tell if they're distracted or not, okay? If there's a loud noise going in the background, kids hollering, whatever, they're not gonna remember what you said. A lot of the title companies and escrow companies and lenders and all that, they say, hey, don't text to confirm the appointments with your, with your um, clients, make sure you pick up the phone. I'm a big advocate of picking up the phone because people can see text messages. Yes, that's a good way to confirm and not confirm, but you need to get that verbal communication. And plus that allows you as a new loan signing agent to build that rapport before you even get to the table. So I would always recommend when you're confirming the details of your assignment, say, hey, Mr. Client, can you please make sure that you make a copy of your driver's license? I don't do the back because in New Jersey, I mean, they just don't care, but the front of the ID is important. Um, now, if you get to the table and they say, oh my God, Ty, I forgot to make a copy. No worries, right? You can either give them the email to the title company or you can give them an email to you. But again, it's all about electronic security. No matter what, I would not recommend putting your, your pictures on your phones. Just confirm it and have them do it when you're confirming the appointment. I want a great approach. Thanks for sharing that because that is where you take care of it. And if they, you get there and they didn't do it, they can do it after the fact. Exactly. That's their loan. Let them be responsible. Exactly. They're adults. That's what I say, Laura. If you want to delay your, you want to delay your refi payout. Hey, that's on you. These are the instructions that you have to follow. This is per your lender. This is what they want. So I was I also thinking, um, Ty and Laura, Bill and then Judy. The thing is that they've been contact, been in contact with someone before we got there. We're at the very tail end of the deal, yeah. so they've had to provide other documents prior to like maybe if it was um, their tax return or other documents that they needed to provide. So if it's not there and which it will, that will occur, as was mentioned, do it at, have, put them in contact with, the, with their point of contact and then you make your notes so that whoever you are contracted or working with, you let them know what you ha ha what you did. To inform them it wasn't there and I always make my notes to, to, to cover my assets. I like I like to cover my assets. I may have to use that. <laughs> make that a t-shirt, Jamie. <laughs> okay. Um my able-bodied Gloria, assistant Gloria, who's right here, just informed me that there are several people on the chat who want to tie this in with using an electronic journal. And when we use an electronic journal, we scan 
the driver's license in, but we do not keep it on our phones. I think that's an important point. We don't keep it anywhere. We scan it in and we log in the information the same way that you would be logging in the information in your written journal, in your written notary journal that we all used before some of us decided to use electronic journals. So it's ta they're, they're tamper proof um, and we are not going to be held responsible for anything because we just scan it in and it's in our journal the same way it was in our black notary journal that we used to carry around with us. So can somebody, would somebody like to comment on that? In regards to the electronic journal, Jude? Well, it seems that people want to know, you know, you're, you're not taking a picture with on your phone, but you mm. are scanning a picture with your electronic journal. Yeah, so I'm going to be honest with you. I've never used an electronic journal. I know there's electronic journals out there like Notary Act. I think there's some other ones out there, right? Um, but I don't personally use them just for the simple fact of security. You never know. Anybody can hack you. But it is simpler to do it, and you're not carrying a, you know, a big journal along with you. So I think it's people's preference, but I think you have to be secure no matter what. That's just my opinion. Because you're, you're dealing with people's sensitive information. You know what I mean? So... So I see nodding. Laura, do you use an electronic journal or a regular I, journal? No, I use a hard copy journal. Uh, yep. hard copy. Okay. And Bill? I definitely use a hard copy journal here, but I think one thing that we really need to clarify too, because I can see lots of questions, there's not necessarily going to be um, federal regulation or statute that you can re reference in some of these, what we would call best practices, right? There's just ways to mitigate risk, and that's what we're trying to do. So if you make a best practice uh, that is very secure in uh, uploading or obtaining information, and every now and then you have to make exceptions to get things done, you can make those decisions on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Mm -hmm. The idea here is that you don't want to be out all willy-nilly transmitting personal information that is going to put your customers at risk and then put your commission at risk. Right. The other thing too, is I think if we panned out a little bit, the over the bigger challenge here is, and I can't remember if we have a disc on this or not, Judy, so I'm just going to say it, but we get approved to do all kinds of things from lenders and title companies. <laughs> oh, that's fine. We'll do that. We, right. The last name doesn't match. That's all right. We're good with that. We'll just add it to the AKA statement. We do have a slide on that, but you're right. I mean, that's okay. Yeah. Good. No, good. Go on. Go on. So if somebody tells you they're okay with doing something, it doesn't matter. This is all falls right back to 100% responsibility. We are 100% responsible for knowing the rules and laws of our state to right. execute the office we hold. So we can't pass the buck on anybody. You're never gonna be able to go into court and say, well, the lender told me I could do it, so <laughs> I did it. They're, they're gonna come right back to you on that. Right, and there, there are some slides uh, further along that address uh, changes in, in uh, making changes in documents and different things. So um, let's go to our next slide, which is notarizing documents containing blank spaces. I'm going to start with that one because it's my pet peeve. <laughs> and I hate when they come in, not only with blank spaces, but when they come in with a document that was done by an attorney and the last page of the document has their signature, and then sworn to and subscribed by me or by a notary. And I tell them I, I will not sign that document. And I show them, I hold it, and I show them, and I say, it's got your signature on it and mine, and the wrong person could just take it and attach it, and you could adopt a baby or get a mortgage or do something else. Um, there should be some text or something on the top to say, this is an addendum to the power of attorney, or this is a part of the power of attorney, or just take, if it's 10 paragraphs, take number 10 and put it on the top so that that signature, so that people are fully aware. Um, and I think it's our responsibility. I, I know we're not allowed to give legal advice, but I do not think that's legal advice. I think that is 
common sense. And I throw it open to you guys. I think everything that we do is common sense. I mean, I think this is just my humble opinion. Maybe it's the abnormal way of thinking, but I think everything that we do as a notary, as long as you go out and read your statutes of your laws, you know what you're doing, you don't, you know, logically, okay, this doesn't make sense. There's blank spaces here. Should I be notarizing this document? Right. That should be a question mark. Ping, ping. You know what right. I mean? So. I mean, it's a red, it's a red, a note, blank spaces are a red flag. Yeah. Um, and, and I always explain to them that when we, when you walk out of here, I've notarized your document and anybody can go in and fill in those blank spaces and not necessarily the way you might want them to, or not necessarily if it's a power of attorney reflecting your wishes. And um, again, Sometimes they're sometimes they actually literally thank me and don't know what to say. And they're so happy that I told them and they go get it fixed. And sometimes they take the paper and they say, I'll go down to the notary down the street. She'll do it. And I say, <laughs> oh, uh, well, OK, so um, what do you guys think about this? Yeah, I just want to uh, add to what um, you were saying, Judy, um, uh, two, two different issues. One is, is that blank spaces need to be addressed mm -hmm. and it's not my place to tell them what goes there, how it should be filled out, but you need to address it and they can address it many different ways. They could be putting an N slash A because it just doesn't apply. It was a choice that wasn't needed. Mm -hmm. uh, they could write none. They could draw a line through it. I mean, there's lots of things they can do, but it needs to be their choice mm -hmm. on how they're going to take care of that. And if they don't know what to do, they may have to call the issuing agency or the receiving agency mm -hmm. to find out the appropriate direction. And then the other thing that I heard you start talking about, which is when um, uh, you've got the notarization on that last page, but it really doesn't have anything identifying it to go with the document itself. And I got to tell you, that is a big problem. Mm -hmm. And you have lots of ways to address that. One is if you use the NNA style certificates, and if you're a member, you can download them for free or you can buy them. On the bottom, they have an optional section, which by the way, some states it's not optional, it's required. Mm -hmm. You can fill out information about what does this belong to. If you're not using that, you could print it right there under your notary stuff. You could just print this belongs to this document and this, you know, blah, 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 blah so that um, it's very clear this was meant to be right. a particular document. And, and I call that safeguarding right. the document. And in some states where it's allowable, uh, you can use an embosser. Not all states allow their notaries to use an embosser. So again, I think what Ty said was really important is what does my state say I can do? Right. And what options are available to me to safeguard those documents? Um, there's another thing that if they end the document up high, um, you can write on there, and I don't think there's anything wrong with writing on there, the remainder of this page has been intentionally left blank. Um, if you have a whole page that's blank, um, anybody today that knows how to play with fonts and that knows how to work a computer could go in there and add extra word wording in there. Um, and, and again, I, I also think that that's a safeguard to make sure that you're not giving them something that you've notarized that XYZ person can go in and change it. I agree with all of you all. And in particular, what you first said, you know, Judy, if the document was, the first page was complete, but the second page had the signature and the notarization mm -hmm. part, I think that's what I heard. Then what, you know, Laura said, writing on there, mm -hmm. that this second page is for and putting the title of the document and then embossing over that is good. And you can even indicate this page was embossed, you know, so all your little safeguarding tips to do so that they wouldn't take that second page which just has a signature and a notarization and attach it to something else, you can specifically identify what that page is for. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. As long as you safeguard and as long as you make sure that you as the notary are not notarizing something with blank spaces and 
something that is just I I'm for me that's just a, a red flag that I signed my name they've signed their name I've signed my name and there's nothing there so I always make sure that we address it somehow um, and I think I think that that's really important so let's go on where we shall we go on to the next slide I just wanted to say someone says that they had escrow officers tell them uh, not to do that. Well, the escrow officers and sometimes the loan officers, they'll tell you what to do and what not to do. Once again, is something that you have to know your state's laws and you have to know, um, what do we call it? You said safeguarding, things that you need to do to prevent problems because you are the notary. Mm -hmm. So you should know what you should and should not do. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. And Jamie, you won't remember this, or you might, but um, you're the one that taught me that when you are attaching a certificate to a document, get yourself a stamp and put it on the document that says an acknowledgement has been attached to this document. Do you remember that? Yes. That when you told me that, and that so that if they get separated by any chance, you've acknowledged on the document that, hey, I did an acknowledgement and you stamp it. I know, you know, how many times do we tell people, make sure these don't get separated because your document has to be with your certificate or your acknowledgement. Make sure it doesn't get separated. But when they leave you, you don't know if they get separated, mm -hmm. you know? So, okay, we're gonna go to the next slide. Obtaining copy certifications of vital statistic documents. Now, not every state allows copy certifications. So I wanna be clear that you have to check with your own state guidelines. I live in Pennsylvania and New Jersey is 10 minutes from where I live and I'm allowed to do it and New Jersey is not. So you have to check your state guidelines. If you are allowed to do it, then you have to make sure that you're, that you're not doing a document that you're not allowed to do. So for example, you're not allowed to do that for a birth certificate. You're not allowed to do that for a certificate of marriage. You're not allowed to do it for a death certificate. So if you are going to do copy certifications and if your state allows it, we're, we, I do passports almost every day because um, we're allowed to do that. And sometimes I get, a person that comes in from New York and they have like a lot of documents because New York does not allow it. Um, I see Ty, Ty is shaking her head because Ty's from New Jersey. You're not allowed to do that, right? Uh, Laura, are you that allowed is correct. To, no, are you, are uh, Laura, are you allowed to, you're not allowed to do that. No. Okay. And we are, and you, it's a form and I get it. I got it from the NNA um, and I made it billable. And um, it says that Laura came to me and showed me her passport and a copy. And the copy was unaltered, unchanged, and is the exact uh, copy of the original. And I can certify that I saw the original. Now, the one thing you can't do, if they come in with a copy and they don't have the original, you can't do the copy certification because they could have gotten it from anybody. So you, you have to, they have to show you the original, make the copy, and you're the one that's certifying that you saw that and that they are the same and nothing's been changed. So I don't think any, Jamie, are you allowed to do that? Um, we can do um, copy certifications, but we can't do it on the vital statistic documents. No, we're not. It has to be that right. originating agency. Right, and, and so um, if you're allowed to do it, it's uh, people, I, I get a lot of requests for that. So we're gonna talk about handling documents that have already been signed. Hey, Jude, quick question. Jude, I'm sorry, sure. quick question. Sure, sure. Um, Jamie and Laura, and I put a statement in there about stapling versus paperclip. Mm -hmm. Can we touch on that just for just for a moment? Because there's, there's different, uh, you know sure, what I mean? Absolutely, go yeah. for it. Yeah, so Laura, do you wanna? Or Jamie, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, go uh, for it. I, I saw that and I, I back it up with, with what Laura said earlier. Know your state specific notary laws. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. We can say yes, I say staple, you say paper clip, but then what if your state, like Laura says, California says this, but well, then you better go with what your state says. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, cool. That's all I wanted to do. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to add one more thing before the next topic, and that okay. is all 50 states, all 50 states agree that you may not certify copies right. of vital st- statistics right. documents. And some even have some additional beyond that. But you don't have to worry about, is that in my state? That's in all 50 states. That's right. Absolutely. They say no. Right. And, and it's birth, marriage, death. And I, and, I don't, and I don't believe we're allowed to certify a divorce decree. No. I don't believe we're, yeah. So no. those are the documents. Um, we use it a lot for passports, um, a lease, something like that. Um, but we're, we're, no, the, the vital statistics documents, they got to have the original. And I, I just want to add, I mean, Laura just made a big statement because think, uh, Ty, you're the abnormal notary, but I think I should be the abnormal notary because I'm in Louisiana. In Louisiana, we are the only state that is a civil law notary. Right. And I saw someone earlier from Louisiana. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> How long? So thank you for being here. But I'm just going to add really, really, really briefly, our, um, our tests, in case those that don't know, our notary class is six months long. Our test exam is six hours. Wow. What? That's crazy. Yeah. We as notaries here, we're based on French Napoleonic law. <laughs> uh, right? Wow. To prepare documents. So I can prepare a will. I can do small successions. I can um, notarize a divorce decree. We have the responsibility to get our documents recorded. So there's other little things that we have to do and that I, that I do um, when I do my notary signing, I have prepared a waiver to cover me. So because the lender is going to get the documents recorded and I don't want anything coming back on me. So I have a, a hold harmless statement that I prepared to cover myself. Okay. So that they say, it's okay, you know, you can let the lender do it. So I'm covered. So when she said all 50 states, I mean, that was a big statement because we, as our civil law, we're in there. We, we finally are on the same page with the other 49 states. It's something. <laughs> it's something. It's not much. You will rarely hear me say that. <laughs> so who would like to talk about handling documents that have already been signed? I'll let anybody. I'm, I I just love being on the panel, so I'll wait to listen. <laughs> okay. Um, when you handle documents that have already been signed, you have to have the uh, Laura. Is it the verification oath? The documents have already been signed. If, if it comes to you and it's it's already been signed. So first of all, it just depends on the notarial act you're performing. Because if it is an acknowledgement and it can be pre-signed, then you're going to have them verbally admit to you right. a sign of their own free will. Right. Um, and, and then in terms of how do you safeguard that, uh, I'm going to look at that signature. I might look at the signature on their ID. And of course, I'm going to look at the signature they're going to affix in my journal. So though, that's kind of how I tie that um, together. If they've or if they've signed on a document that's a jurat or an oath upon verification, then I make them sign it again because right. there is no other way for me to fix that. I do a lot of that. I make them sign it again. Yes. Um, and I and I often make them sign it in a different color. If they signed it in black, I tell them to sign it in blue, and then I attach the certificate. And um, I get an awful lot of that because they don't know and they come in and it's already been signed. And, um, you know. Damn that, I agree. All Laura, right. Do, do you guys see any tr- any trouble in requiring someone to sign an acknowledgement again, just to help safeguard? No, there's nothing no. wrong with doing that. Um, I, if I know my law and I know what, uh, you know, I can do and I cannot do, uh, that's where I start. And if, if there's a reason for me to feel like, you know what, I would just be more comfortable with this. If I could watch you sign, it's, you're not breaking any laws by doing that. 
You just didn't have to. The, uh, I, I do it every single time, guys, uh, unless it's a, a lot of times in Arizona, we get the, um, the title transfers. So they're selling a car mm. um, and they'll sign them ahead of time. And those are original. So those can complicate things a little bit, but. And, and that's interesting that you say that because I'm a title agent. I'm an auto tags agent. And I was told from the beginning that no certificates, no nothing. If they've come in and they've signed it, I am not to notarize it and they are to get a new title. Nice. That it is, it's considered a debased title. Right. And I'm just wondering whether you're right, but um, that's not the way I, I was told by the person that mentored me in that business. That's a tough business. Yeah. And I was told if they so much as cross out um, a, a letter, if they signed their name wrong, like, and they cross out a letter or, or whatever, deface title, they will not take it. Yeah, and this is really state specific too, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, they get really upset with me, but, um, you know, again, I don't want to lose my commission. Right. And so yeah. I tell them, yeah, and then a lot of times they come in and they've already, I think, and this could be a whole, a whole forum, not just today, and we can't really go into it as much as I might like to. But I think that people Google now what to do. And when they Google what to do, they try to help the notary. So they say, I have, I have people come in all the time and say, well, I signed all these things because I wanted to help you. And, um, and then nicely, you want to say to them, no, let me help you. And let me show you the right way. But I do think that a lot of people now go to Google and Google is the expert. Do, 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 do you guys get that? Do you get a lot of that? Yeah, See, I mean, I Google, I call it Google Streets. It's called Google Streets. It's where you can find and Google anything that you want an answer to. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's right. You know what I, I mean? You still have to research. You still have to validate I, what you just researched. So right. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, I, I had a man call me yesterday for apostilles, and he spent 20 minutes explaining to me what the Secretary of State told him and what he read. And then he called a different Secretary of State because he was thinking that it might, and it was 20 minutes. And finally, I said to him, I think you're going to do real well. <laughs> 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 he wasn't going to use me. I knew he wasn't going to use me because he is doing the research and now is the expert. And really what he was calling me was to see if I was going to tell him anything different. But, you know, Judy, I also think that people do not really know what a notary does anyway. Agreed. I agree with that. One of the main reasons why that. I yep. love being a notary. Because when I first started, I'm like, I'm a public official. I'm so right. excited. And nobody's like, oh, you're just a notary. That's so true. These you're right. type of um, platforms are good educators. And we carry, we have to carry our, our title well. And let people know. Because they really don't know. They say, oh, well, I thought you just sit and stamp stuff all day and it's like well then then we have to educate i even have those free little um um pamphlets about what a notary is and i love to give them to people who are my clients so that they can be educated with my card stapled on it <laughs> <laughs> there you go all right somebody in the chat uh, posted that in michigan they're not allowed to require to have their signer uh, sign a second time. If the signer doesn't want to do it, they can't force them to do it. Interesting. Uh, I didn't see that in Michigan statutes, which I just reviewed recently, but I will take a look at that. But I think the point they're making, which is important, is you got to know your state laws. So you've got California, you've got um, uh, people from all over, Louisiana, Arizona, and we're going to answer mostly from our perspective uh, and uh, it may not be that answer in your state. So if you see contradictory answers going on, it's because this, this is not federal, this is state specific. 
Uh, and that's why it's so important that you know for yourself, even if I tell you, yeah, I can do that, it doesn't mean you can do that. So uh, it's so good for you to research your own uh, state statutes so that you can be confident and competent as a notary in your state. Yeah, uh, I let's, agree. let's do one more slide and then maybe we'll answer some questions in the chat, but let's talk about signing a naturalization certificate. So a naturalization certificate is a federal document. And I have spoken to numerous notaries and I, we, this is not state specific. This is the whole entire United States. Notaries cannot put their seal and stamp on a naturalization certificate or on a federal document. And so um, when someone comes in now, I will tell you that I have people that come in and they say, my boss said just to have you sign it. And I tell them, well, you're going to have to tell your boss that I can't sign it. And, um, and sometimes they're not real happy. But notaries cannot. It is your responsibility. And that's not something you have to check your state-by-state -state guidelines. And that's why I thought we should put this slide in here, especially for newer notaries. When somebody comes to you and they have a naturalization certificate or a federal document, it is your responsibility to say, I can't notarize that. Okay, and you know, somebody asked me this morning, um, what's the most, what's the hardest part of learning to become a notary? To me, it's maybe learning what you can't do versus what you can do. There are things you just can't do. This is one of them. Um, so what do we have? One more. Oh, perfect time to take a break. Completing an I-9 verification. In another document where you cannot put your stamp and seal on the document. Um, you can learn how to fill it out. Um, it's easy. And you can learn how to fill out section two. And you can learn that the, the information that they need on the back. There's a column A. And if they have the column A, it's fine. If not, then they have to have one for column B and one from column C. And after you do it twice, it won't be a problem. You will know what you're doing. But they now send them in with 15 pages of directions for the notary. And most of the directions for the notary say, have the notary put their stamp and seal on the document. And you can't do that. And sometimes I turn around and I go to my computer and I say, look at this. And it clearly says the notary cannot put their stamp and seal on this document. And they say, well, that's not what my boss said, or that's not what my supervisor said. Um, you believe me, trust me on this. This is not where you want to put your stamp and seal. Um, I, uh, it, it's a, it's a great thing to do. Um, and, and it, it helps you helps people in your community who are getting a job and really need to have this filled out. And it does it. it, it I get a lot of calls for these, but you have to do them correctly and you don't want to put in. Now, there are two tips I'm gonna share with you because um, Notary Day in Maryland, Elaine Wright had this guy from Homeland Security there and he was amazing. And two tips, if you're gonna keep a file for one I-9 verification, you have to keep a file for every one you do. But you can't just keep one and then not one, and then one, and not one. Because if you ever get a visit from Homeland Security, yep. they either want you to say, I've never kept a copy. This is what I've done. It's in my journal. I don't even know if you have to put it in your journal, but I do. And then, but I've never kept a copy. Or, but they, but they don't want to hear you say, yeah, I, I made this one copy of this one guy one day. That's no good. The second tip is there's a link in the on the internet and it is about 15 pages of instructions for completing an I-9 verification. And if you have an office or you're going out and you're gonna do I-9 verifications, you technically should have that available if they ever ask to see it. I'm eight years, no one's ever asked to see it. I have it in my office. 
I have, you know, I've printed it out and I have it in my office. No one's ever asked to see it, but it's a good idea if you have an office or if this is something you do a lot. If you're mobile and you, you know, you go to these places and do an I-9, just keep one copy with you so that if that person read the internet and says, hey, can I see that, those instructions, you have them. So do any of you do I-9s? I think there's a big caveat we need to talk about for California, right, Laura? On I-9s? You want to okay. jump in on that one? You're muted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> So in California, unless you're a bonded immigration consultant, you are not allowed to fill out an I-9. Wow. It's an immigration form, uh, and uh, you would uh, want to refer your, your client to a bonded immigration specialist, which is could also be a notary. But if they don't have that registration and that $100,000 bond, you're not allowed to fill those out. Isn't that interesting? Uh, Ty, are you, do you do them? Are you allowed to do them in New Jersey? I have not done them, actually. Um, you okay. are allowed to do them, uh, but I have not done one yet. How about you, Jamie? I've done a few, and then the company was giving me the job, and then all of a sudden they stopped. And I did not investigate to see if there was a change in law because I was so busy. But because of talking about this, then I'm, my, my little tentacles are moving, so I'm going to get back and research. <laughs> I'm going to research to uh, see because it is um, a good diversify. You know, it's it's a nice little mm -hmm. diversification to add to your business. It is, and um, and you know, I mean, it's another thing that you can add to your services. Yeah, here's the thing: there are there are companies that do these now, almost like little signing companies, but for I nines. So yeah. those are the offers you'll often sometimes see 15, 20, $25 come through because they take a little piece of the pie. But sometimes you can build a direct relationship with these either payroll departments, HR. Mine was a VP uh, in the human resources department and they paid 50 to $75 per appointment for these I-9s here in Arizona. And that was a, that was a nice little hookup because it always seemed to fit and you could oh. kind of schedule them. They'd say, hey, sometime between these dates, we need to get this done. So I could add that on like a bonus to one of my signings. So I'm going out. I got to drive 26 miles to Surprise, Arizona. And along the way, I've got a couple of I-9 visits. I can right. around it. So it really yep. did make that kind of nice. Yeah, I charge 40 and um, they come to me. They come to my office. Nice. Um, and um, But I think also a lot of the large companies now are doing them remotely. Yeah, they are. I, I think that has uh, that has put a crimp in, because um, I know I don't get nearly as many as I used to. But if you can hook up, well, like Bill said, with one of these companies, um, if they have like a lot of people that they're hiring, I had one once and they were hiring nurses in Pennsylvania. And for like two months, I had like five of them every day. Um, you know, so yeah, I mean, if, if that's something that comes across your path, um, that's a good little, little income stream. Um, so, shall we look, shall we spend a moment One and look question. at the, okay. Please, Laura, um, do you know of the, um, a company that, um, people could go to, to become, what is it? The immigration, the bonded immigration oh. consultant? Sure, there are several of them out mm -hmm. there, actually many of them. Uh, the NNA does have a class for that okay. uh, themselves. Uh, and uh, you can type uh, training for uh, immigration document specialist, something like that, and you'll come up with uh, training for that. And uh, the biggest thing that you wanna know is that $100,000 bond, which is a California requirement, that is not, Florida doesn't have any requirements. And we don't <laughs> They're loosey goosey. They can do what they want, but uh, and there's a couple of states that it's just absolutely prohibited. They don't care what you got. If you're not an attorney, don't do it. So this is really important. But for California specifically, that hundred thousand dollar bond runs eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars for wow. a two year bond. Goodness gracious. Okay. Okay. So and this is on top of your notary bond that we have, which is 15,000 and your ENO insurance that we might be carrying. So this is a, you know, 
I don't know that getting it so that you can do I-9s, because I think the volume of I-9s has gone down. It has. But there are many other documents, DACA documents, uh, Freedom of Information Act documents. There are many other documents that you can choose to um, uh, handle. You don't have to handle everything. It's not like being a notary and you got to say yes to everything they present you. Um, when you're an immigration consultant, you can specialize within all those immigration documents. And Ben uh, Graber, who's in the Bay Area, uh, was a speaker on Notary Symposium, talked about that, and he does do training. And I, uh, BG, I just can't think of his contact information at the moment. But if you want to reach out to me, and our contact information will be at the last slide, uh, and ask me about the immigration training, Ben is fantastic. And he knows about which states where it's prohibited, where it's allowed, what the requirements are. Uh, even though he's in California, he knows the national requirements. Yeah, and you, I, he doesn't have a, a huge web presence, but on LinkedIn is where I found him. So Beautiful. find him on LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Ben Graber. Ben, I'll write his name in. Ben Graber, immigration consultant and trainer. All right, so let's go look at the chat. Um, okay, we'll go up here. Uh, hello, I'm um, well, okay, I'm going to look for questions. Uh, hello, everybody. It looks like we are answering a lot of questions. Um, Judy, hey, hey, hey Jude, can you, hey, oh, Bill, sorry, sorry go, ahead. That? go ahead, Ty. Uh, hey, Jude, can you just let people know, because a lot of people are asking, is this recording and is it going to be sent out? Can you yeah. just touch on that? Yes, the recording will be on um, Notary Coach on YouTube. It will be on my website. Um, and Ty if, uh, and Laura, yeah, it's gonna be on mine. Yep. if you guys want it, um, you know, is it, yes, it is being recorded. And yes, we will have it. Yeah, and Jude, I do want it so I can put it on my, uh, yeah, my YouTube I had, channel. I had several calls this morning of people that said something came up. And I just want to make sure yeah. it's being recorded. Um, so yeah, cool. we'll go back then and we'll, we'll do some more slides like do, uh, signers signing documents with a mark. And mm -hmm. that is usually the elderly. That is usually someone who no longer can write. Um, my dad did it, you know, was just a mark. Um, when the, when in before and Laura, you can correct me on this, but five, six years ago, uh, someone was allowed to hold someone's hand and kind of direct them and help them. Is that correct? I'm, I'm not aware that that's ever been allowable. I'm not saying it, it doesn't happen. Okay. But I but know it's not allowable. It's I know not it's allowable. not. I know that. If, if they can't, if they can't make the mark on their own, you could help them get their hand there to the right place, all of that, right. but they gotta right. let go. If they can't okay. do that, some states have the next level, which is signature by proxy, but not all states have that. I don't think that Pennsylvania has that because I researched that once for a client who could not make the mark. Yeah, Michigan and Colorado, I believe, do right. have that. And there's a few other states that Montana as well has that. Right. And, and so check your state guidelines if that comes up. If you have a person who is elderly, maybe in a nursing home um, or in a hospice, and they just can't do it anymore. And then a lot of other things come into play. Are they competent? Uh, do they understand? Do you feel that they know who you are, right? And what you're doing there. Um, and, um, and so competency plays a big role in this. Um, I think competency is equal to making the mark um, because we've all gone to these places um, and you just know that it's, there's not that I've, I've had doctors tell me, I don't know what you're doing here, but this person doesn't have a clue. Mm. Um, any comments, ladies, J Bill? Well, I was just going to, this is um, Laura's field. I know it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just going to say, um, I have, because I, 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 I have clients that are deaf and blind. And I have that little square mm -hmm. thing. I can't think of the name of it now, but it it's 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 like a signature guide. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I keep that with me for blind my blind clients and my elderly whose hands may go all over the place. And I'll use that for them so that they can, so they have a guide. And it just kind of helps keep their signature in a certain area instead of me holding their hand. I, I, I'm not going to do that, but I use that as my guide. And that's I, one of our tools that we put in our book. Yeah, and may, there are procedures for a mark. You can't just uh, say, oh, I, oh, my signer can't sign his name. We'll just have him do a mark. Right. Most states that allow for that, not all states address it. But the ones that do typically require witnesses, typically it's not the notary who's the witness. Uh, so make sure you know what the procedure is before you get into that. That's a, maybe another good thing for another forum where we could go into that a little more. Because I, I seem to recall that when when Jamie and I were, were researching this for a different project, um, if it's a blind person, First, you have to discuss with them what is in the document that they're signing. So you get a, a handle on that they do know exactly what they're signing. Um, and if it's a deaf person, and I've had a lot of this, um, they come in with a notebook and they write. And then you write back to them. And you have a dialogue of you know what the document is. So, um, okay. 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 <laughs> uh, handwritten letters. I am the queen of not only apostilles, but handwritten letters. I get them all day long and they come in and they have them on a piece of paper and they write, you know, um, my son's moving out of my house tomorrow or I have a dog and my son has a cat and we're going to trade and, and they have to have it notarized. Very important. So, this is a situation where you can do it as long as they have the right identification. Um, it is dated. Very important that it's dated because you are going to use a certificate, a loose certificate. You're going to attach it. For the most part, they always choose an individual acknowledgement in Pennsylvania. We have an individual acknowledgement. And, it, and a lot of times that's what they choose because I think they think we're not allowed to choose for them. They have to choose. And I think they see that and they think it's the simplest. And it basically says that they were before me, I sign it, and that I did a handwritten letter dated February 20th, and it was one page, and it is attached to the handwritten letter. And uh, I, I do that quite often. Um, is that similar to California, New Jersey, Louisiana? I think it is. I think Laura's got a really great story here about that brother and sister with the uh, the weight challenge. I think that would work really good. But I think this is a awesome opportunity to talk because one of the most common questions I get is, do I use an acknowledgement or a jurat for this handwritten letter? And the, these notar the notary is trying to make a legal decision so I'd love to hear some perspective on that as well mm -hmm. as the stamp, the acknowledgement or the jurat stamp, because I think that in handwritten letters, those can come in super handy. Laura, do you want to dive in and share your story on that? Or Oh, I, I would, but I, I've talked a lot and I just want to make sure other people have a chance to share as well. I don't want to hog it. No, you, for, for me, Laura, you're not hogging. I mean, like I said, I am, I am come on, honored Laura, to, tell be, your, come on, Laura, yeah, tell your story. to be on this story. Yeah, so just go for it. Well, the story, story separate from that is just one of my unusual requests was to meet a brother and sister at the local Burger King at the mall. And their, um, what they needed notarized was documenting a bet. And the bet was who could lose a certain amount of weight in a certain amount of time. And the loser, meaning the one who didn't do it, was going to have loser tattooed on their butt. Oh, God. And so they had a track. <laughs> they, they, they wrote it out, and that's the consequence. And then they both signed it in front of me, and then they swore that that was true. So, you know, when they say anything can be notarized, <laughs> I'm telling you, it could be anything. And they uh, chose they chose the jurat for that then? 
Yes, they did. Because I, what I shared with them is, look, I can just prove you signed this document or you could swear this document is true. What would you like? You know, since it was just a personal thing between them. And, but that is typically how I present my question is I can prove you're the one who signed it, or you could swear what you signed is truthful. What do you think you need? What do you think the people yeah. you're giving this to need? Because that's all that matters is where are you sending it? What do they want? Right. Right. The receiving agency. So uh, that is commonly asked, not just on handwritten letters, but all kinds of forms uh, because there are many documents that were not set up to be notarized, right. but conditions have changed where now it does need to be notarized. Maybe they're not signing in the bank or signing at the office. And they said, okay, you could sign at home, but if you do that, it will need to be notarized, right? So, so you will get uh, documents that don't have any pre-printed wording for you. Uh, and so sharing with your signer what you are certifying is the best way to help them. And that means you need to know what you're certifying. So when you read the wording for signature witnessing, where it says signed before me or attested before me, you need to be able to say, look, this means I watched you signed it and I proved it was you. Whereas if it's an acknowledgement, I know I watched you signed it, sign it, but that's not what my words say. My words say, you admitted to me you signed it. Because what we fill out is the certification or the notarization. It is not the stamp. So the best way to help your clients is to know what your words say. And then find a, uh, a, an, an easy way to shorten that up so that they can understand it. Beautiful. I like it. Um, we have five people that have their hands raised. So let's see day one. So allowed to talk. Leonard Wooten. Hi, Leonard. Leonard? He's on mute. Oh, I, un I asked him to unmute. Did he? He hasn't figured it out yet. There we go. I don't think so. <laughs> Let's Shaquana? Bill, see if they're yes. saying that you mute. They say they're saying that you muted all of them, Jew, so they can't unmute for some reason. Bill, see if you see if um you can get Leonard to talk. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. Hey, Jude, I think you muted them based upon the the Zoom. Oh, I was muted as well. Yeah. yeah. Can, okay. Jude, can you hear me? Bill, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can hear all of you. So okay. I am. I hear him. I hear somebody. I... Oh, can you hear me now? Hi, Leonard. There he is. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Modern technology. Uh, I have a question for you. So we as loan signing agents will go to an appointment and uh, you'll get the driver's identification number. You'll look his, at his, um, his signature on his ID. A lot of signers, especially those with longer names, uh, have concerns about having to put their full name as printed below the document. So this is this is one of the discussion mm -hmm. I have a lot. And I normally inform them that legally, I don't think that I could tell them how to sign their name, but the, the requirement for funding of the loan is that the name is signed below the document. Is that pretty much correct? Or do you guys run into an issue with that? I run into that issue all the time. I run into the issues where you have AKAs and then people say, well, this was not my name or this was my mating name. Why is this here, right? Um, to me online, when you're doing a loan signing, loan document, they need to sign exactly as it is typed out, period. Um, they don't want any deviation from that. So whatever is typed on the loan document, that's how they exactly have to sign. I will tell you, Leonard, though, a lot of people um, use probably wrong terminology. They get really pissed off because they'll be like, hey, I don't sign my name like that. Why do exactly. I have to sign my name? Exactly. Well, if you want to get funded, unfortunately, this is how the lender has presented the loan document. So all I can do is ask you to sign date and initial here. Okay. That's all you can do. That's just my two cents on it. Yep. So uh, I just want to add to what Ty said. I think loan signings is kind of a, um, a special situation 
where there are instructions that come with our confirmations that say, look, this is how they're supposed to sign. So how do I avoid the practice of law? Because unauthorized practice of law includes directing a signer on how to sign their name. The way I avoid that is I say, here's the instructions. It came from title. It came from your loan officer. They said, this is what they want. See what they have on the document? That's what they want. And if they ask me, well, that's not how I sign. Well, let me ask you this. Is your signature legible? If it's totally illegible and we can't figure out what it says, I don't really care. Exactly. It's up to you to, to figure that out. But here's what I will tell you. If it's obvious that you're undersigning your document, there's a good chance I'll be out here again and you'll pay for me to come a second time. Yes. And it will you. <laughs> so now, there you go. Sign. Uh, so That's I don't all you have, have to do. <laughs> Okay, I have a question. If their signature is totally illegible, mm -hmm. do you ever ask them to print their name beside their signature? Well, loan documents, it's already printed. Yeah. But do you ever ask them? Never. To... Never. No. Okay, never. never. In okay. fact, if that to me, that's the, the single most important question in loan signings oh. is that whether or not the signature is uh, legible. legible or not. If it is not legible, I, I, in my head, I'm just, I'm like, yes, we're going to get through this. It's going to go fast. They go fast. <laughs> uh, but if it, it's legible, just like Laura said, if it, if it, the signature line asks for Shelly Ray Smith mm -hmm. and they type S Smith or they sign as S Smith, yep. that's under signing and the lender, there's a good chance the lender's going to kick it back. Exactly. Now in my journal, I tell them, this is what I do. In, in the signature place of my journal, you sign how you normally sign. Because if something comes up later and they say, that's not my signature, I have them sign in the signature place of my journal. And in the additional comment section, I have them sign the way that they signed on the loan doc. So I have both. That's good. So that's if good. somebody that's comes good. up and says anything like that other lady, it's like, oh, no, no, I don't sign like that because people will do, try to do that. I have both. That's so good. whichever way you want to go, let's go. I got <laughs> it. I want to protect myself. Always protect yourself. Okay. Let's talk to Sh Shaquana. Shaquana, can you, uh, can you hear me? Shaquana? Yes. I can hear you. Hi. Hi, Shaquana. What's your question? Hi. Um, I don't have a question right now. I'm oh. just basically listening. Oh, okay. We will get you next time. All so right. let's go to Galaxy A 10E. Galaxy A 10E, are you there? Hey Judy, um, just a suggestion. I'm thinking since we're already an hour and 15 minutes in, how do you feel about going through the slides and then just oh, Answering Q&A. Yeah, I was going to say, let's finish. Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's do it. It's fine. All right. Okay, yeah, we are. Um, so defining a notary, not giving legal advice, um, that is something that you have to be very, very careful about. I remember when I first started doing this, um, telling someone that they could purchase a power of attorney um, and a staples and a notary friend of mine said you just told them what to do and you should never do that and that was he to this man I had given them legal advice and I had told them where to get their power of attorney instead of just saying to them you should seek out legal counsel do you guys agree with that T Ty shaking her head yes Bill yeah. not sure yeah I'll, I'll let the goat talk <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, and I, I think this could be subject to interpretation, of course, but I think one thing, Laura is always in my head and she's always saying that if you're sharing information that is publicly available, it's not really legal advice. But here's the other thing too. And I've seen this, I saw a huge debate on LinkedIn. I see it in the forums too. People are saying, no, if you tell them to go get legal advice, that's legal advice. <laughs> so like, where do we draw the line here? Um, 
I, I think by suggesting, uh, number one, that there are DIY platforms or you could seek legal representation is, I don't, I don't see where there, what could be wrong with that. Of course, someone could find something wrong with that. Laura, what's your opinion on this? I can't wait to hear it. Mm. Well, that's Bill, because it's pretty much along the lines of what you just said. What I, first of all, um, legal, unauthorized practice of law happens when we go from what's generally known to in your case, specific to your situation. Um, and so uh, if anybody can get to the information, I'm not giving legal advice. It's when I cross that line and I say, well, for you, I'd recommend you go do it on a, uh, you know, download it on the internet right. at, at right. Rocket Lawyer. Or for you, you probably, you don't know, have that, go, go to Staples and get it. Uh, but get the one that says durable. Right. When I start doing that, that's unauthorized practice of law for me. But for me to say, you know what, there are lots of ways for you to get assistance with this. You can do it on the Internet with platforms. There are quite a few out there. You can Google, you know, durable power of attorney, power of attorney, whatever it is you're looking for and find it that way. You can go to stationary stores and office stores like Office Max and Staples. Right. Um, and you can seek legal advice directly from an attorney. Uh, these are all ways in which you can get it. So I don't believe I'm getting, giving any kind of legal advice. I'm just sharing information that's publicly known. Right. And, and then you have the other people who come in, I do anyway, and they want me to read the document and tell them if I like it. And I tell them, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't do that. I mean, that's, that's legal advice. Um, and I, I, that could be a conflict. And, um, you know, but they, 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 um, they say, why don't you just read this and tell me what you think? I said, well, you know, we can't do that. And, you, and notaries have to be very careful. And when I talk to newer uh, notaries, I explain to them that if you tell somebody that their power of attorney looks perfect and it's, it's great and they should all go sign it. And five years from now, they're all fighting because they're all mad at each other and and the whole thing is being blown up and they're contesting it. And then they're sitting around the table saying, well, the notary said it looked good. The notary said it was okay. I mean, could they prove it? Probably not, but you're still better off to take care of yourself and say, you know, if, if you have any issues, maybe you wanna seek some kind of legal guidance. Does everybody agree with that? I agree. Yeah, Jamie, Jamie, I was wondering for you, do you walk the same delicate line or is there an expanded birth for you because of being the civil civil law stuff in Louisiana? Expanded birth. I can give advice on because I can prepare documents. Ah. So okay. I can do it, but I, I still am careful that I don't go in, go to the realm of the attorneys here because attorneys here are they're very particular but certain documents that I prepare yes I because I'm preparing it I have to ask questions and get information and and, and give advice just goes to show the, the how again how important it is to know your state rules yeah. and what it's your guidelines are here too all right thank you for sharing all that. right so we're going to go on to the next slide if my computer will let me go on to the next slide. Okay. Um, listening to other notaries or clients who think they know the right way, although it's against the rules. Same thing, notaries being pressured into doing illegal transactions. So somebody comes to you and says, you know, um, I, I got to tell you, my sister's in a bit of a jam. And uh, we got to get this paper notarized. And after all, we went to kindergarten together. So, you know, you know us. We didn't, we didn't do anything wrong. And if you could just notarize this piece of paper, it'll be all over. And as a notary, a commissioned person by your state who has a license, you absolutely have to say no can do. Yeah, here's what's um, so dangerous about these. And... We all have friends that will probably challenge us on this. Mm -hmm. They'll say, hey, I, I forgot my ID or my grandma signed this and now she's in uh, Oklahoma and can you just notarize it for me? Right. 
and it might be easy to say, well, or you might just not want to want the confrontation and say, well, maybe I will. What I invite you to look at though, is that there are probably more, there's probably more than one party involved in that paperwork. So who's ever receiving it, who's ever impacted by it now or down the road, uh, just because you had a friend ask you doesn't mean your friend is the one making decisions to prosecute you later on down the road. Right. It's just not worth it. And here's the thing. I've, I, this just happened to me last week. This is why I asked Judy to put it in here. I had a friend uh, who is uh, living in Mexico, needed a document not notarized for Washington, D.C. They specifically said remote online notarization was not going to be accepted, so he was going to have to fly in. He just wanted me to, to ship it up to me, notarize it, send it back so he could do what he wanted to do. And he didn't understand why over $10, this is an associate, not really a friend. I don't think a real friend is going to really push it this hard on you. Um, over 10 bucks. And I told him, this is not a $10 decision. This is a multiple six figure <laughs> decision. And this is an integrity decision. Okay. The whole reason we exist as notary publics is to maintain or can, uh, maintain the integrity of a transaction. So these are our big decisions. This is not all about the dollar sign or the $1 or the 35 cents or 35 bucks. There's some, right. a much bigger picture here and you will feel pressure from your friends, family, neighbors, clients to do this. And I also real quick before we pass it on, you brought up a great point earlier, Judy, that other notaries will sometimes put a lot of pressure on you because in our industry, we have notaries that have been doing the things the same way for 30 years and, and that's just the way it's done. And it's never been a problem. And one of the major pitfalls of our industry is Things aren't a problem until they're a problem. <laughs> so, and sometimes you don't find out there's a problem until someone dies or a business gets sold or real estate gets transferred. That's when you start to, paperwork comes up and it's not right. So there's no, it's real easy to do the wrong thing for 30 years thinking you're doing the right thing. So well, it's easy just to, 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 to move on, on on this one. I was thinking because there's a notary here and she takes pictures of IDs just like that. She carries no journal and she was going to be out of town and she doesn't live too far from me and she wanted me to do take care of her clients but she doesn't ask me anymore because of my my um, protocol. I'll do what she does. So don't be pressured into doing illegal transactions. Know your law and if you don't know, call the NNA. Right, call the NNA hotline. And, yeah. um, and, and I always say, Put just do it right. Put the effort in it to know, because yeah. what is the point of being a notary if you're gonna be you know, listening to other people as to the rules? And oh, I know man. in Texas, like all the stuff that I have to go through, I'm 30 minutes from the Texas state line and Texas does not have a notary class they do not have a um, notary exam. They don't have anything. <laughs> Fill out the applications. They get the little videos on the Secretary of State's website. Um, give us the money and become a notary. So you do. Ha this is a good format as well. So yeah. I had to, I had to piggyback off of Jamie because in the state of New Jersey. There, there is no classes, there is no courses. They even state that you don't need a journal to record, which I really don't know if that's true or not, but I record everything in my journal. And to become a notary, anybody honestly can become a notary, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody can become a notary, but that does that mean that you're going to be an excellent notary? Is that going to mean that you're actually gonna impact people's life in a positive way? It's just not about a signature, it's just not about a stamp. So that's- and, and I'm gonna to go to the next slide, but I have to tell you that one of the things that really upsets me is that I do ask certain people, I tell them, I can't do that for you. And they tell me, well, my, my notary at home would always did it. She's just on vacation or she's just <laughs> not around. And so it upsets me because it's, it, it's, it's what we all should be doing the same thing. That their notary at home shouldn't be doing any different than what exactly. we're doing. Exactly. exactly. All right. That's, um, so I want to make a real quick um to the enrolled agents, because um, 
they are notaries, but they they haven't participated much in these forums and these type of things. And um, I have had the privilege of uh, meeting some of them, and um, we're going to try to get them to become more a part of what we're doing. So welcome, 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 and we hope to see a lot more of you. And uh, now we're here for signing agents. So signing agents failing to sign and stamp their name in all places where they need to. And um, Bill and I talked about this. And what I tell new signing agents is, and then I'm going to throw this to you guys because you do more signings than I do. Um, if you don't look at everything before you leave the client, if you don't turn the pages and you don't look at everything and you don't make sure you didn't miss that one initial or that one place where you were in a hurry, maybe they were chatty. You all know I'm chatty. Um, so if you, if you miss that one thing, you are going to be back in your car on your way, whether it took you a half hour to get there or an hour to get there because you're not going to be able to, to make this happen. And it is so simple. At the end of a signing, I always say to people, now I need five minutes so I can do my housekeeping. And you'll be really glad I did this because in case we miss something, I'm going to find it now and not tomorrow morning. And I've never had anybody say anything, but, oh, that's great. And then you just turn every page and you look and you eyeball every page. And nine times out of 10, it was that one little thing where you didn't see that initial or you didn't see that. And so um, Bill had mentioned this, that this was one of the critical problems. Uh, so, Bill, take it away. Yeah, no, I think you um, kind of speaks for itself, guys. I mean, the most common mistake that you're going to get called back on, miss signatures, miss stamps. And um, I, if you've read my blog or my book or been in my course, you know, I advocate for checking four times and I still check four times. I check. So in, I'll just real quick give an overview. As soon as somebody's signing, I'm watching them sign as I'm shuffling papers. That's my first check. At the end of the signing, like uh, Judy just said she does, I do one check. That's my second check right there, the full document package. Then I go out in the car. If I'm somewhere visible, I pull around the corner or I'll swing by a Starbucks and I check for the third time. And then before I drop at the escrow office or at the shipping center, I check a fourth time. Sometimes changing the environment you're in and removing the pressure of those signers staring at you can make you see right. that you may have missed before. Right, right. And if you're just starting out, if you're just starting out, do not cut time by cutting out checked documents. Build this into your logistics. It takes 15 minutes to do to send invoices, uh, communicate, whatever you got to do after a signing, and then check the package in your car. Build that into your schedule, and you'll get a lot more peace of mind and make a lot less mistakes. Yeah, I have to agree with Bill. Um, I am. I, I'll tell you right now. I. I don't have a problem telling y'all that I've missed out on signings, on signatures, on stamps. I've done it plenty of times. I've had to even come out of my pocket and, and pay for a label, right? Because it was my fault. I'm not going to ask the title company, hey, ship me a label because it was my fault. I think a lot of people as new loan signing agents, they say, well, do I really have to go back out and make that signature? Do I have to really go back out? Yes. That's the only, in my humble opinion, that's the only way that you're going to grow in this business. If you take the proactive approach to say, you know what, it was my fault, I apologize, let me go out, let me rearrange my schedule to go get this signature for you, it's paramount into your business because I've made a lot of mistakes. Like I'm a big advocate for Notary Go and Notary Go, I mean, I, I can go on a whole tangent about them, but they call me now, right? Because even though I've made mistakes, I communicate it. That's all they want. All they want you to do is say, hey, this mistake was done. I'm gonna go back out, I'm gonna take care of it. Oh my gosh, Ty, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's all about communication. It's all about owning up to your mistakes and then correcting them and then pushing forward. That's it. Don't stay stuck in a mistake. I love that you brought up because the spirit in which a mistake is fixed is directly correlated to your longevity and success in this business. Not to mention peace of mind. We're all going to make mistakes. I still make mistakes. I, I get chatty too. I forget to stamp the deed of trust. Whoops. That's kind of a big deal. So I, I have to go out and get that fixed. But if I ever miss anything, number one, it's 100% responsibility. Do not argue. 
just be part of the solution. Get it fixed. If we got to work something out after the fact, you can do that. But just get the problem fixed. Be part of that solution. I agree. Okay. Signing agents holding their documents for too long. Right. What, that, what, we're, what we're trying to talk about here is that you go home, you're tired, and you've done a few signings, so you think, oh, I won't have to worry. I'll put it in the FedEx box tomorrow. But then tomorrow you wake up, well, you California people don't, well, we do, with six inches of snow on the ground. And how are you going to get that to the FedEx box, to the FedEx store? Because the FedEx store is, you're going to have to get there. You can't get there because there's ice on the ground. Or you wake up and your kid is sick or, or something happens. I always make sure that at the end of the night, two things. My, my packages are out and I have invoiced. And if your packages are out and you have invoiced, then you don't have to get up tomorrow morning and think, oh God, I got to get to the better, <laughs> then I got to get the invoice done and I wonder and I out. It, it, it is such good advice for signing agents. And I see Laura smiling. You're on mute, Laura. Yeah, you're on mute, Laura. I, I know, but I pushed the space bar. And it, <laughs> I, I'm just smiling because uh, this, uh, this is an issue. And, and, and sometimes it just happens. It, uh, I had too much going on on one particular day. And, um, and it was just recent. It was the holiday. Uh, and I, for some reason, thought mail's not happening. FedEx isn't happening either. And so I went... Uh, I, I didn't worry about dropping it in time. And then I started hearing about delays and other things going on. So I called the um, company I work for and I said, look, here's what happened. It's going out today because I thought uh, FedEx wasn't open yesterday. Uh, but I understand now that it was. So you were expecting to receive it today. So how about if I run back over there, I'm going to grab the package back. I'm going to scan the entire thing. It was like 180 pages, scan the whole thing to you. And then I'll put it back together and get it out today. Um, so I proactively got a handle on it uh, for them. And they were so happy that I was willing to do that uh, so that the signers could, you know, close on time. Uh, and, and I, I typically, I'm, you know, I look at three o'clock, what do I got in my car? What do I got going on? I need to hit a FedEx somewhere or UPS but sometimes it can happen. And if it does happen, get on top of it. Don't right. wait for them to call you uh, mm -hmm. to say, hey, those documents didn't show up right. and now you can't fix it. Yeah, I agree. If, Go for it, James. If you have a situation where your closing is at seven or eight in the evening and you know that it's not going anywhere and you definitely have something to do in the morning or you not going to be able to be there they already know that the signing is in the evening i say learn your area I, so exactly I don't, I don't go to drop boxes but no walgreens the, yeah <laughs> there are a couple of ups's in my area that have a door slot in there and there's a fedex just one fedex location that has that they know me so I slip my package in there and I throw it in. <laughs> it, it's, it's there. That's why they put the door slot there. So when they open up the door the, the next morning, they pick up the, the packages. It's not in a box. It's right there at the actual UPS um, store. Yeah. So, yeah, so I have to know go your ahead, area. Jamie. Know your area. So I have, I have a piggyback off of Jamie real quick. So for me, I'm, I'm, I'm very OCD when it comes to dropping off the loan documents. I want that FedEx receipt that has that tracking number on it. Because God forbid something happens and the lender calls you and they say, hey, well, where's our package? Uh, I don't know. I just dropped it off. I did it. Right? So I think you should always, always get that tracking receipt. Even if it's just a drop off, it takes less than a couple of seconds for them to print it out. And you have it just in case. You have it. Yes. Yeah. I agree. My suggestion was for um, an extraordinary type of thing. Yeah. I don't do that just yeah. habit. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, just 
on a regular. I like those receipts as well. But yeah. what I'm saying is if it's something that's extraordinary and you don't want, you know, like if you're leaving out of town or whatever, like, like the, the snow issue. And I know that is, hey, on Monday, it wasn't bad. But Tuesday, they said it was going to snow, snow, snow. I had a couple of jobs. I wasn't driving out in that snow on Tuesday. It'd be sliding all around and stuck somewhere. So I dropped them off Monday so that they would be there. So yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm I agree. I'm, I want extraordinary situations. Yeah, yeah I, I, love agree. That. I love I agree. that you brought up uh, extraordinary situations, Jamie, because that's what we're talking about here, guys. We're not talking about signings that close after six. That's important. We all know how to do that, right? We're all professionals here. What I would like to highlight too is, um, and, you know, I own a small signing company and we run into some challenges here. So there are three points um, that we run into on occasion. I have to say, I'm so impressed and so uh, grateful for the elevation of this industry over the last three or four years. This has been amazing from a signing company owner perspective. Uh, you guys are amazing, especially that you're here on a Saturday, carving mm -hmm. out your time to learn even more about this. But number one is there's no urgency. So we have some people who just don't understand that um, by signing a loan package, there's other stuff that has to happen. So you're like, oh, I'll get to it next week. And that happens a lot, unfortunately, in this from people who maybe don't have uh, the training that you guys have. Another huge one is, and this is big right now, is you've packed your schedule so full mm -hmm. that you think you say you don't have time to drop uh, packages off at FedEx, UPS, or whatever it is. That, to me, is unacceptable. You have to build this into your logistics schedule. You cannot sacrifice someone else's future, their loan terms, their, ser their service, so you can make more money. So right. you've got to find that balance. If you're going to, like, I'm crazy. You know, I book 12 of these in a day, but I I work my logistics so I can make sure everybody's getting handled. That's right. I mean, I don't save it to the end of the day because that's when stuff goes wrong. One thing goes Always up. Always goes wrong. Or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. The other one is, and this has happened more times than um, I'd like, is people throw their... Uh, they'll put the loan package in the envelope, throw it in the back seat, and then it gets buried and it's forgotten about for a few days. And then you're like, sometimes I'm the one calling, sometimes the title company's calling. Um, I've never had a note. Well, I've had one. I've had one notary say, oh my gosh, this is what happened. Um, so the, to piggyback on that is if, just like uh, Laura was saying, if something like this does happen, everything can be corrected with the right spirit, the right energy, the right attitude to correct it, but own it 100%. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me you dropped it off because I got tracking records, right? So I've had conversations with some where it's, oh yeah, I dropped that off last night. And then 15 minutes later, the tracking comes on. Oh, it was dropped off at 8.09 a.m. this morning. So you got to take 100% responsibility for this stuff and realize mm -hmm. what the bottom line is that this work matters. People are relying on you. Thank you for letting me go off on that. Uh, I, I want to add one thing that happened to me once. I know it never would happen again. I put everything in, a, in an envelope and I didn't put the check in its own envelope. Mm. And so whoever probably opened that up, took everything out and threw away either UPS or FedEx with, with the check. And of course, that was my mistake. And of course, they were angry at me. So another piece of advice, if you have check or checks, put them in an envelope so that when somebody's opening the mail, it's harder to lose an envelope than it is just one check that might, they might pull the papers out and the check stays inside. It happened to me. Uh, the person would never use me again. They just would never use me again because they, and I owned it, but that was a mistake and it cost a lot of money and they said so uh all right we're going to go on bill this one is yours signers using point and sign we discussed this um not not giving them a whole five hour spiel but making sure they know something about what they're signing yeah this is uh this is a pet peeve of mine right we're we're we're, we're paid to deliver a certain level of service uh, to present documents uh, and to facilitate these signing appointments. 
And we do not get paid to explain documents, but we don't get paid to just say, sign and date, sign and date, <laughs> sign and date. You are doing your customers a tremendous disservice, not only just the signers, but you're representing the closing agent, the lender, everyone up the chain uh, in a negative way if you adopt a point and sign strategy to try to pack these appointments in. Number one, it, it's counterproductive. You think you're saving time sometimes, but you really don't. What this point and sign strategy does is it creates fear and un, uh, insecurity around the signing. So sometimes your signers will slow down and read more than they would if you gave a brief explanation. And sometimes they get fired up and just pissed and they call the lender or it just ignites a storm. Um, when I, have an opinion on that? When yeah, I I'm, go, ahead, you. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead, you. Oh, so, so when I, so when I've done loan signings, I have people that come in, they've either seen the closing disclosure, which is honestly, you guys is just replicated throughout the loan documents. Those numbers that you see on the CD is throughout the entire document, right? For me, when I'm doing the signings, I come in, some of the signers will be like, Hey, have you reviewed the documents? Have you got the CD? Do you have any questions? Blah, blah, blah. They'll literally say, Ty, I don't want you to explain nothing. Bye. Just have me sign, date, and initial. I'm like, okay, but I'm here to explain to make sure you understand, blah, 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 just to go through the documents I'm supposed to. I'm good, Ty. Just, I have to go. So at that point, for me, it is kind of pointing and signing. I still do like a high-level overview just so they know. Um, but I get a lot of clients, probably I would say 90% of my clients don't want to hear the mess. They just want to sign so they, so they can go. So... Oh. But Ty, aren't they usually Ty, aren't they usually <laughs> aren't they usually people who have this is like their fifth or sixth signing and they because that's what they tell me. They I know all these papers, I've read them all, and just show me where to sign. Yeah, and I mean, you can yeah. do with anybody like that except no. show them where to sign. Correct. And for I'm gonna be honest with you, for me, like Bill said, I give them the option. Hey, have yeah. you seen this? Do you want me to go right. over? They'll either say, no, Ty, I'm good, or yes, Ty, let's just go over it a little bit. Now, I will tell you this. When they say, hey, Ty, let's go over it, I'm probably going to run over my time because they want to read every single dadgum thing in the document, right? So for me, uh, I give them the option. If they say, Ty, no, I'm good, then I'm pointing and signing. I'll still give an overview, but I'm not going to waste time and aggravate them if they already told me, hey, I don't want you to go over it, if that makes sense. So that's my two cents on it. So let me get an understanding. Sure. Um, Bill, you were saying that you don't use the point and sign, or you do? No, never. Um, so I have a, I have a, all my signings run pretty much the same. I say the same thing on the document. I might say it a little faster. Here's what I find. Most people think they know a lot, but they really don't. And I don't care if they've signed these things 20 times. Exactly. <laughs> they don't know. So I'll go through the same same thing. Okay. This is your escrow impound account. This is the disclosure that says that you won't subdivide your property. We're going through. And a lot of times people say, Whoa, wait, what, what am I signing? <laughs> exactly. Seen that before. So I know that they need to know this stuff. Like, and I'm, so I'm, I'm going to do what they, what I know they need, not necessarily what they want. And it's the That'll same, it's the same spiel. It's just done maybe a little bit faster in my exactly. signing. Yeah, a lot right, faster. Exactly. So, I don't want to, I don't want readers, right? I, I want to avoid inspiring a reading session if at all possible. Yes. <laughs> yes. <You're> absolutely <laughs> right to do so, but I would rather them feel confident in the process and sign it. So that okay. I'm sorry, I get it. Be a long explanation. That's okay. <laughs> so what all I right. was going to say, I point and talk. Exactly. Because the document has the 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 verbiage that's like you say it's the same thing what i do is that closing disclosure is what i want people to see first me too because it outlines i i tell them if this is not right there's no reason to move forward because you know what you've discussed with your loan officer i'm here to facilitate the whole signing and I want to make sure that this is what was discussed. I, I go through that first. People are like, great, this is it. But I'm pointing, like, much like probably what you are doing. Uh, you're 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 talking because you you know what each document is anyway. And oh, so, yeah. like, say for example, 
if it's the compliance ag agreement or the ENO um, limited power of attorney, there's that little sentence that just for clerical or typographical errors, point to it, say it. And, and, and that way they're following me and they're seeing it and they sign. But then I did a presentation some years ago for the NNA and it was to discuss the type of signers that we encounter. Overly chatty, nervous, yeah. um, ones who just say, look, like Ty said, come on, come on, get it done, get it done. So I say, use your point and point. I say point, talk and sign. And then I say, also accommodate the type of signers that you have, because that's just like you said, being wise. I love it when they say, look, I've done this. I just done it up. Great. Okay. Exactly. Great. <laughs> what, what feels that's like. a happy, that's a happy talk. Yes, <laughs> they're signing and whatnot, and I still keep talking, but I'm still shuffling and going. I'm moving and going, and and, and we get it done. So I just wanted to get clarification. So I say PPS, not PMS. Point, talk, and sign. Yeah, no, Amen. that's exactly it. And Amen. That's, that's, that's a great clarification because <laughs> that's excellent. Point and sign. The point and signers that we're referencing are where you don't you don't present or describe the documents. You're just like sign the date, sign the date, sign the date. But what Jamie just brought up is a huge part of efficiency. You, when you point with your pen, they will follow it. And then I always do a call to action. What do I want them to do? I want you to sign and date right here. I want you to sign and date right here. I want you to sign date and then you initial right here. I'm doing that as I'm describing the document for sure. Right. Because if you if you let people languish on the page, one thing to remember is nobody wants to look foolish. So if you haven't set the tone for people to give them permission to sign in dates, to slow down and read things if they want, or just sign and go, then they're gonna sit there and they're going to stare at the piece of paper because they think that's what they're supposed to do. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. So you can, have can it, give them permission. Can I give you a real quick thing? And we only have three more slides, but I just want to tell you, I went to a signing once and the woman that opened the door had, and, and this is, this is, you should never, ever treat them all the same. She had no teeth. She had a cigarette dangling for wherever. Oh, and the house smelled like, <laughs> the house smelled like they had been smoking in there for six years and she had her house coat on. I'm just going to get to the crux of the story because she got out her cap, her calculator and her, and her pen and she put on her glasses and she was a former legal secretary and she knew every piece of paper that she was signing. She found errors in the closing and she called the title company and they had to redo the closing and I had to go back there the next day. Oh, she boy. was she was not to be messed with. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, okay, I'm going to the next side because I heard we're running late. OK, notary making changes to a document that making changes to a document um, is first of all, you should never make changes to a document. Um, there are times when. You will get permission to initial a change. So sometimes if the middle initial was printed wrong on the documents, but that's not your decision. That's title's decision. That's not your decision to say, oh, I could just have you initial that. Am I correct, um, uh, signers? Yeah, yeah. I have, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So I had a story. He was a real estate attorney. OK, this guy, you know, said, I'm a real estate attorney. I could update the mortgage. It's not correct. This dude proceeded to write on the loan document the correct amount <laughs> that he was refined. He was like, I don't care. I'm a real estate attorney. I can mock up these documents if I want to. I'm the one that took out the loan. OK. At that point, I was like, OK, sir, I, you know, I can't tell you what to do. But what I'm going to do is stop the signing at this point and I'm going to make a phone call. Right. And that phone call directed me on what to do next. So um, to your point, Jude, I mean, for me as a, a notary, I don't mess with loan documents unless it's in the notarial instructions. The only thing that I can actually modify is my notarial certificate, that notarial statement on that loan document. That's all I can touch. I can't touch anything else unless I'm directed to do so. so. And, and I, would not, I would not make changes to anything without someone's permission to do so. Exactly. Uh, it, yeah. 
And I will tell you, sometimes I get loan documents that are out of state, right? So the venue, the state, the county of the notarial statement could be something different. With that being <laughs> said, if you're doing a notarization, let's just say in Somerset, that's the county that I live in in New Jersey, if I got a, a, a purchase, which I just did a couple of days ago, a purchase, and they were purchasing a home in Florida, right? I have to be, I have to get a subscribing witness as well for Florida purchases. So when they came in, uh, I had to change the venue, the state and the county or the jurisdiction, venue or jurisdiction, whichever one you want to use. I had to do that in order to say, okay, this document, even though it was, it was created in Florida, I'm notarizing it here in New Jersey. So I had to mark up that notarial statement, but that's the only thing that I touch. So that's my so, two cents on it. So while we're on the subject of changing, how about when you call, and try to change the appointment with the with the signer on your own. You yeah. can't do that. That's no yeah, good. No, that's a no no. Yeah, that's, that's a no no. no. Um, and yeah. if and if if notaries want to know why, because yeah. sometimes those documents all the time those documents were made for a specific date, yeah. and they were made with the with the with the mortgage rate of that day, and yeah. and other things. And if you go ahead and change the date. Uh, that closing will not go through. That's Only correct. I to add to that, Judy, is unless the company gives you that privilege. So, like, I have a loan mod right here. And they, they told me, get it done within three or four days. Right. So, unless there is something specific that they give you the permission to do. Right. But otherwise, like you said, no changing dates. No changing dates on your own. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, here's what happens, guys. So a lot of times, uh, 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 and it's not necessarily um, initiated from the notary, but it'll be initiated from the borrower. And they'll say, hey, I got friends coming over. I forgot yeah. it was my yeah. daughter's birthday. Come Can tomorrow. To tomorrow. <laughs> and you're thinking, well, I happen to be available tomorrow. So yeah, why not? Right. So while that might work, it, there's what's important for you to take away from this is that there are huge implications to changing a loan signing appointment in a lot of cases. So as Judy um, referred to, there, the documents very often are date specific documents. They're expected, the, the per diems, which means the interest per day, the taxes, everything are scheduled and calculated based on the signing happening that day, the right to cancel, all that stuff. Some lenders care about that, some don't. So just get permission, just don't do it all willy nilly. Get permission from the hiring company so they can escalate it to the closing agent who can escalate it to the lender and make sure that it's okay. They're, they might have to redraw documents. They might have to um, make some other arrangements. There's also the rate lock issue. If you're working with purchases, even on refinances, rate locks are a real thing and they can actually cancel like or, or expire. And if a rate lock is right up to the edge and you move an appointment without getting permission, that's a huge impact. Yep. That could be from like 2.9% to 3.25. Yep. And, and, it's a big and, deal. So just get permission. And we also want to add in here that because this is so date specific, if you wake up in the morning and you are very ill and you know no matter what, you can't make that signing, call and leave a message at six o'clock in the morning as soon as you know so that they can get a notary to get out there and do it so that you won't have a problem with the documents having to all be redone. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And um, I believe this is our this is our last slide. Um and this is funny, but it's signing agents forgetting to invoice. And um, most signing agents who forget to invoice then are really pretty upset because they didn't get paid. Um, so uh, my advice and as a signer, and, and I'm, I'm a little bit uh, anal about all this, I just make sure I get those invoices out before I go to sleep. I don't let them wait until the next day or the day after um, I just make sure I get them out and that way they're out and whatever happens the next day, the phones start ringing, people start calling, jobs start coming in. You got to go here. You got to go there. Um, get your invoices out. Now there are companies who we have problems with and they just don't pay. And then you don't, that's up to you. You don't have to work for them anymore. If you have a problem and you're not getting paid, it's up to you whether you want to accept work from that company anymore. And I see you smiling, Bill. 
Yeah, the um, so I, I'm right there with you. I like to I like I like every appointment to be buttoned up right after it. I send the invoice from my car in the middle because or at uh, right at the end of the signing because I know that I've got a lot of appointments. I'm going to forget, and when I get home at night, I don't want to keep working. I want my appointments to be done when I'm done. So I'll send the invoice right away. And a lot of um, new signing agents, especially, or even career signing agents work with signing companies where they don't have to invoice. So we're not talking to you on this one. You don't have to invoice unless you have an internal invoicing system that helps you track your uh, who's paying you and how, when they're actually paying you. But I would encourage everyone as from a, an efficiency standpoint, because what this is, is Kaizen, constant continuous improvement, but also refinement of your processes. If you're wondering, how can I get more signings in a day? Or how can I get home at night and actually enjoy time with my family when I'm not spending three hours doing scan bags and invoicing and doing all my bookkeeping and tracking my mileage? This is one of those ways that can help. Button it up at the end of the appointment. And if you, um, the less, one lesson too is if you're doing escrow direct, because when things get jammed up is when they don't fit into your normal system. So you want to have a system in place. So even if you have an internal invoicing system, so you know who's paying you and who's not, get in the rhythm of doing that. So when the escrow direct comes and says, hey, send me an invoice, it's already part of your process and it doesn't jam things up. I have been fired by escrow officers because I took, I, it was out of my element and I was like, oh, I'll do it later. I didn't have a system. I had to make it on Microsoft Word. So it, I put it off and put it off. I get too tired at night. And then they're like, look, we're just trying to pay you. It shouldn't, we, sh we shouldn't have to work this hard to pay you. We're just not going to use you anymore. Yeah, I have to agree with, with Bill on the whole invoicing. There's a couple of things. So for, for if you're on Snap Docs, so Snap Docs is what they call vendor pay. Vendor pay is set up through Stripe. So you have the ability to set up your, um, I don't want to call them direct pays, but they're vendor pays where um, that lender, that signing company has the ability to invoice you through Snap Docs. Now you have some companies on Snap Docs that will say direct check. That means they're going to use your profile mailing address to, to mail you a physical check. I always tell people when they say, oh, sign up to 100 companies, you already know my, if y'all have been following me, I hate that 100 companies. Sign up to 10 or 15, which are good, that give you consistent business, right? Then from that point, you have the invoice. And I use Square because I have a general notary business. So I use Square. I have the ability to set up on my website. I have the ability to invoice. I have the ability to do um, appointment setting. Um, there's also a company called Invoicely. They're really good. QuickBooks is really good. Um, there's, a, there's a plethora of invoicing systems. I wouldn't get hung up on which one to use. Use whichever is best for your budget. That's mm -hmm. what I would recommend. All right. Now, I want to introduce you one more time to Laura, Coach Me Laura from Modesta, California, and Ty Brown, who is the normal abnormal notary from New Jersey, and Jamie Liggins, and here she is, and our man, Bill. Here he Thank is, Sir Soroka. Thank, Thank you so much. And me, your queen of apostilles, just here for you. Now, I want to tell you that if you click on this link, you're going to be able to download a book, which is this whole presentation. And you will be able to download it, view it, download it, do whatever you want with it. You will also see on the last slide,